Mandy Fields is somebody I've known for a lot of years. Mandy, uh, you are, I think, uh, the brand manager more or less for Bell Media, uh, both on radio and TV here in London. How long have you been with them? Uh, since 2009. Right. So, uh, and I think it's pretty interesting that you have such a broad uh, array of interests that you're involved in, and you're a real kind of, I think, uh, a real master networker. And, and I learned that from your time when you were on the food bank board with us. And you did a lot of great things for us. And I think lots of people in London uh, understand your networking abilities, but what they maybe don't know is just you, you tend to uh, work on projects or zero in on projects that are quite different and quite innovative. Some of them you have started, others you've come on and helped to build to another level. But I just wonder if we could talk about a couple of those. Uh, for instance, how did you start with Tampon Tuesday? I think that's a really big one. How did that start? Uh, thanks, Glenn. I was I was with your wife. I was a community relations coordinator for A Channel at the time, and uh, I had a tour of the food bank, and I was asked um, to come up with a different idea this year how we could support the London Food Bank during the spring food drive, and I was with at the time news director Cal Johnstone and at the time on air anchor Dan McClellan and co executive director Jane Roy. And when we were in the non-food item cupboard, um, you know, I saw the the shampoo and the toilet paper and the toothpaste, and um, and then asked about were feminine hygiene products donated, and, and Jane said no, because mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of funny, and I use humor to deflect a lot of things. Um, I was very aware in that moment. I had lived period poverty, um, so with that our family was pretty, you know. We, we lived in poverty, but I didn't really think about it. I didn't really talk. I didn't talk about it at the time, but that's why, like many people, when they've had adversity, you see things because you've lived it. And that's where Tampon Tuesday came from in that moment. And um, and then conversations began and uh, people said, yes, we could host a networking event. And uh, the food bank, yourself and Jane were right behind it right from the beginning. There was zero pushback and it was a great, great community collaboration right from the get-go. But it didn't stay within the confines of London, right? It, it, it broadened. I think you, you started working with Shoppers Drug Mart and other things. Can, can you go into that a bit? Yeah, you know, I have goosebumps just with you saying that because um, even though, so London Food Bank said yes right away, Don Mumford at the time, the general manager said yes right away. One ask to one restaurant said yes right away. But then we started getting no's. That was really interesting. And it, we started getting some no's that people were uncomfortable with what we were doing. Um, but then when Shoppers Drug Mart came on board about seven or eight years ago, so we were about, so we're 14 years in. And when Shoppers Drug Mart um, said, hey, we want to be a part of this. And what do you guys need to keep this message going? Um, they became a formal partner in the London market only. And then once we had that sponsorship, that paid for radio spots um, because that's essentially is my job come up with ideas that make an impact on the community but then we can find corporate support so i can find revenue for bell media but i can also make impact in the community mm -hmm. so shoppers drug mart really fit this bill perfectly once we started getting this on-air support on ctv on virgin radio and on digital it blew up and it blew up in a really big, beautiful way. And I mean, last week, last week alone, they launched in Sudbury, Owen Sound in North Bay. So all of Northern Ontario. And so 14 years later, it's not going away. It's only it's only getting bigger. So it's, it's really it's really fascinating to me how the simplicity of an idea matched with a phenomenal need. And then it's it's a, it's a marathon from there. It just doesn't go away. But it's a national people give. It's a national program it, now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's national. It's in the United States as well. Yeah. That, that, that's amazing how it's grown. But essential to it really was the the corporate help that came from Bell, uh, for instance, uh, but also from shoppers, their ability to network because they were across the country as well. But I do remember, I think <clears throat> Jane and I used to talk about this that 
Uh, you know, we used to bring up feminine hygiene products during a food drive, for instance, when, when we would do an interview and somebody would say, what would you need? And, and always when we said that, there was this kind of discomfort, this kind of silence that went with it because of the subject matter, right? What I appreciated about you is you just came in with all guns blazing, right? And said, let's talk about this. It's an important part, not just of a woman's life, but for women and families that are enduring poverty. And you had this kind of uh, charm in the way that you went about it that got people to join in. But I think if it hadn't have been for your forthrightness, it might not have done as well in those early times, I think. I think you really made it work. Mandy, and, and that was really great. Have you always been like that? Have you always been kind of direct like that on subjects that matter to you? Um, thank you. I, I guess so, you know? I mean, I don't know any other way. Hmm. I'm just, do you know what I mean by that? Like, I just, I'm just me. I don't, I, I believe in transparency. Um, and um, I get impatient when people aren't transparent with me. Yeah. And so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, I don't like to be manipulated or taken advantage of. Yeah. And I do believe that you have the right to ask and someone has the right to say no. So I, I just want to have that fair transaction. I think, I think that's why. Um, and yeah, I think in general, I'm six of seven kids. So I've probably had to be a little bold um, to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to kind of, I, I think, Probably, I feel like if probably because I don't know any other way. Yeah. Well, and because that is the way you are, it really got the rest of us to have to focus on it and have an ability to talk about it. And I've seen you in numerous settings where you have talked about it just directly, like anything else that's in a conversation. And I thought I think that helped all the rest of the folks who really believed in the cause but didn't know quite how to address it or bring it up or introduce it. I think I think you really helped us with that. You were also instrumental in starting Fields to Forks. Now that's interesting. I wonder if you could just go over that a bit because that has an impact too on food and poverty. Oh yeah, I, I love Fields to Forks. Um, and, and again, back to the directive of my job, come up with ideas that make an impact in the community that bring in revenue for the station. Um, and that's where Fields to Forks comes from. I grew up in Exeter, Ontario. Park Hill, Huron Park, mm. that whole area. And I was surrounded by farming. And I just asked a simple question one day. I said, why aren't we telling more positive stories about food, where our food comes from, and the men and women who make it? And uh, from there, we built it. And uh, so Fields to Fork started seven years ago in London, Ontario. And uh, you, <laughs> we knocked on your door during COVID to see if you would help us voice a spot when the campaign went national. So we were in like London, Kitchener, Windsor, and Ottawa, chugging along for about four years. And then when COVID hit, it was like the whole world woke up yeah. to food security. And who are these men and women making this food? And how come I can't find any more uh, flour on the shelves? And because it was COVID, our normal way to try and get um, actors and voicing, it was all such a new world for us at Bell Media. Um, I always thought you had a radio voice, and so we uh, put a, a call out to you, and, and I'm not stroking your ego, but it, it is, that's how it happened, that's why it happened, because it was because of COVID that the world saw, we need to understand where our food comes from, what the circular economy is actually about, and Fields to Forks went across the country with your voice in it, um, and uh, it's, it's still thriving. We're in Toronto this year for the first time. Um, that was a really tough market to break. Um, in terms of um, connecting urban and rural lives and where our food comes from and trying to tell those stories. So that's been a really exciting um, piece of the Fields to Forks puzzle, actually, because Toronto GTA area has such a massive viewership and listenership, being able to get this, these messages out in that market. And that'll begin airing, I think, August 22nd um, for harvest season. Um, pretty excited about it That's and then you work with amazing people yeah. all over this country you yeah. get to know the farming community in a completely different way and understand things you know about you can't call in sick the weather's your ceo um you don't yeah. take vacation you know there's just so many it was super humbling i gotta tell you 
all my complaining at times with my job. And then you actually sit around with a group of female farmers. You listen. Yeah. That's part of what we worked on together was the female partner piece, right? We were also up at Brescia College for a meeting about that, you and, and Jane and I. But I thought that was so revealing because it, it uh, it's, we, we just think of farming like we used to think of farming and it's not like that. You know, when you realize the responsibilities that women have to keep the, the family business together, plus the family and everything else, it really is amazing. It, it is, and you know, there was a beautiful collide between the Fields to Forks program and Tampon Tuesday mm -hmm. because of the distribution centers in rural Ontario. So the egg farmers of Ontario, they noticed it first and it was through our conversations with Fields to Forks. And they heard about this Tampon Tuesday program and they said, hey, can we sponsor a Tampon Tuesday? Can we have one of our egg producers speak at a Tampon Tuesday? Mm -hmm. And then all donations go to some rural food banks yeah. and i was like hell yeah let's go and it was so much fun and we, and we it continues to go on it's pretty cool that was amazing mandy we've learned so much from you in the years that we knew you and then when you were on our board we learned from you there but can i ask you to flip that for a second i'm not trying to get you to talk about the food bank but when you entered into onto that board and got involved with the food bank what were some of the lessons you learned around poverty during that time Hmm. Well, I was really honored to be on the board. Uh, thank you. Um, well, certainly seeing what goes into a paper bag for one person, um, watching, watching the dignity of the, the staff at the, at the food bank in terms of, uh, you know, poverty is so, can be shameful. That was one of the reasons why I went public about Tampon Tuesday before I used to say, oh, I'm creative. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I did say I live, lived in poverty was because I recognized my own shame mm -hmm. and being forward about it. But I also witnessed it at the food bank and, and the shyness, right? Um, people's head down, coming through the doors, um, needing to feed themselves or needing to feed their families. So I, I learned a lot about dignity mm -hmm. and humility. I learned how far you can get with not having you know, fancy brochures, not having perfectly painted walls with having cracked tiles and the content of the work is how much more important that is. This, the substance of the work versus, you know, clean, shiny, perfect tile walls. Um, and I was with a group of people, that board of directors and the staff at the London Food Bank and cut very much from the same cloth that, that we did not work in hours we worked in project completion yeah. and that was how we worked. Mm -hmm. And that was really, um, you know, Wayne Dunn. Business cares. Yeah. Being business cares, food drive, witnessing that level of work ethic and belief in that we can make a difference, but not at the expense of telling other people's stories either. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it can get complicated in my brain. Yeah. But I, I learned a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I learned a lot from the London Food Bank and what integrity is. Yeah. I did want to talk to you about Indigenous issues, if you don't mind, Mandy. I think there are two, two women who I really learned from, not just learning, but seeing their commitment and being inspired by it are people like you and Lynn Davis. And I know that there are many others um, that are involved in Indigenous issues. But I think I remember when we were talking before this started, you said something about how you originally years ago got excited about many causes because of the Stephen Lewis Foundation, right? And under the African sky, which I think is where we met you from because of our work in Sudan all those years ago. Can you just take us on a bit of a chronology there that was the Stephen Lewis Foundation? How did that start and where did it go from there? How did you end up at Indigenous? Uh, so the Stephen Lewis Foundation, I used to work as a palliative care worker at the John Gordon Home, also known as the London Regional AIDS Hospice. So I worked there for 10 years, from 92 to 2002, and um, saw a real, a real shift in people living and dying with HIV AIDS in the London community. And um, it was in that time period that I started hearing this name, Stephen Lewis, and um, 
was fortunate to hear him speak. And then when I transitioned from the John Gordon home into event planning, um, my first event was AIDS Walk and proceeds went to the John Gordon home and the Stephen Lewis Foundation. And, um, and then from there, I was really sparked by, I could see the differences in the availability of antiretroviral medication mm. in here in North America, in London, Ontario. And then I would hear Mr. Lewis speak and be, and hear him talking about um, the, the groups that the foundation was supporting in Sub-Saharan Africa being handed washcloth. Yeah. And so just this disparity mm -hmm. began that I, that I began to witness. Of course, it had been going on for years, but I wasn't aware of it and um, got really hooked. And then that's when I started reading about you and Jane and your work in the Sudan. And it was all around the same time that the first event I did in support of the Stephen Lewis Foundation. And of course, others like Louise Fagan was on the committee, Leslie Garrett, and we put together Under an African Sky. Um, in those conversations though, Mr. Lewis had said to me, because I, I got to work with him, I'd been to his house a few times and try not to be too much of a fan girl, but I was just so inspired by him He's that and way. the way he spoke. Yep. And <laughs> um, we talked about if you really wanna do this work and he talked about Paul Martin, that take a look at the reservations in Canada and that's when things started to shift a little bit um, for me um, and then started reading more and I started shifting my thinking about not so much as global help, what, you know, what could some of this effort do if I channeled it here locally and, um, and then, but it happened very naturally. Um, it wasn't anything like it was like a to-do list. Yeah. It was just kind of the way my brain works and my body works that if I see something and I start thinking about an idea and it's just kind of will really take hold. And um, if I feel it and it doesn't go away, if I can't shake it, then then something normally starts to formulate on its own. I'm never good if I get hired to do an event for somebody because it's not natural. It's mm -hmm. a weird process for me um, versus if I just create it and then you meet. I always call it the good people. And it's, it's a weird thing to say because it suggests that I think I'm a good person, but I don't know how else to express what I mean when I start meeting the good people on the path who want to do this work as well. And you meet an Ojibwe artist, Sean Kuchi, and that was the first event. And we were like-minded. He made art. I didn't know how to make art, but I knew how to find walls. And that first art show was called See Me, mm -hmm. um, where we installed 2000 gold birds, Sean's art went up. It's now permanently installed at Losa Family Healing Services. Um, and that was probably the beginning. And I think that's 2016, maybe, I think 2016. And through that work and then supporting at Losa um, and then creating the at Losa Peace Awards with some wonderful colleagues of mine at Bell Media, Tanya DeJong and Amanda Taconi. And now I'm very excited. Our current general manager, Jennifer McClellan, she stepped in as co-chairing with Heather Cabral at Atlosa. So I love I love seeing when the work continues. I like watching Tampon Tuesday fly mm -hmm. and she flies around and she hasn't stopped because the need is there. Yeah. Well, watching Atlosa Peace Awards go into its fourth year where we recognize people in the seven sacred grandfather teachings and watching that and then watching because I'm I've stepped I've decided to take a look at some housing the housing crises mm -hmm. what can we do there and seeing um Jen Jen McClellan be the co-chair along with Heather Cabral which is together two row wampum somebody from Atlosa somebody from Bell Media working on it together and I, I'm quietly supporting behind the scenes it was through this work of supporting Atlosa I met a guy named Ray John Jr. and then was honored to be invited to many people's homes that the housing situation really, really kind of took hold. And that's where the Imagine Build comes from. And, you know, you're supporting it too. And that's the thing. That's the good people. The good people showed up. We got a lot of no's. We're still getting no's. But we have enough now to build three houses. 
Yep, and you're going for four. Is it a million dollars? Is that what you're uh, trying to raise? You're roughly at six hundred thousand now. Is that correct? Yeah. Roughly at six hundred. A lot of in kind donations and the good people, Lynn Davis, right? Mm -hmm. Mimo Dowda, Tammy Denemy, mm -hmm. Kathleen Anderson. My God, I go on now. Doug Terry, Doug Terry Holmes. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought a year and a half ago that a guy like Doug Terry would say, you know what, this is the project. Last week, sitting with Doug Terry, Jamie Yakowski, Pam Tobin, who's the CEO of Oneida, talking about the water. Yeah. Really getting like an actual serious plan about water. Because they're still under Never water, water advisory there, right? Yeah. Still right. under boiled water advisory. Yeah. You know, Mandy, if, if we could just be frank for a minute, I, you know, I grew up in Calgary. I spent my first five years in Scotland, but then grew up in Calgary and my dad volunteered a lot with the Blackfoot indigenous community just outside of Calgary. And uh, he would take me along to those things. And I, I was very much aware then, even when my dad was talking about it, it's just one of, it's, 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 pardon the analogy, but it's a bit like Tampon Tuesdays. There's just some things that you don't really talk about. It's there, but it's not really front and center. I, I began to realize that it was um, institutionally the, the indigenous world was getting much better known in that time. You know, institutions realized they had responsibilities. Not only that, they realized where they had really failed over the course of over a century. And they were trying to find uh, ways to uh, address that those failures. Uh, and then, you know, just a month ago, Jane and I, we I had to speak at the Governor General's Leadership uh, uh, Conference in Muskoka, Right. And, you know, about a third of the folks that were there that were delegates were from indigenous communities from across the country, many of them young. And, you know, even there, the speakers were from places like Stats Canada, the Royal Bank of Canada, all of those places. And even there, where it was now acknowledged that something needs to be done, there were still kind of tensions. We, I could sense it for them, indigenous communities and for us. And I, th I think... My sense is, although we as a food bank have been involved uh, at Oneida for over two decades uh, doing different things around food, the, the reserve here just outside of London, I, I, you know, it's been important, but it was something that people didn't really gravitate to. But something has changed. Something mm -hmm. has really changed, not just institutionally, but with individuals. I presume it's easy to say that that's because of the residential school graves that have been found and continue to be uncovered and, and disclosed. Um, do you think that it was actually, though, just for the average public, where they're much more on side with this, we saw that again during candidate just recently, do you think it's the residential school thing that did it, or do you think it's something more? I, I, think, I, I think it's something more. I think that, um, I think that uh, a lot of friendships um, I'm just, I'm just pausing for a minute because I mean, we, we started the work that I was started doing was before, you know, the unmarked graves started revealing themselves. And so many of those friendships and relationships that began was prior to May, 2021, when the first 215 unmarked graves were, were revealed. Um, so I think it's I think it's trust. I think it's consistency with the non-indigenous community with the indigenous community. I think it's when if you're not indigenous and you give the ability to listen, yeah, and truly listen, um, I think trust then can can develop. Um, I think sharing sharing space almost feels like buzzwords, but I I so believe in that. Yeah. Like like literally when I was asked to sit on the Juno's host committee in 2019 i just said yeah, sure yeah. but can my coach here in london yeah. i said sure uh, and i was asked to work on the indigenous honoring ceremony i said but can my co-chair be indigenous and so i i do that intentionally and i got a yes mm -hmm. um received an award from brescia and said what can brescia community do for you and i'm like maybe have an workshop <laughs> and they did yeah. for ojibwe artist sean kujina's daughter and, and you were there yeah. Um, even with the CCMAs in 20, whenever it was last year, 2021, and I was asked to do some work, create some activations and the same thing. I said, 
I'd love to, but can we have an Indigenous artisan market? And can my co-chair be a young woman from Oneida named Shaylin? Yeah. And they said yes. Yeah. So I, I do believe that when you consistently share space, relationships begin and and there's a something forms a bond forms when you create something together a bond definitely forms yeah you know mandy i've always seen you as a, a dynamic woman of change but i have come to understand you better i think in our friendship over the last number of years in that you really are you're trying to change people through consciousness, not just through projects. And I think the Indigenous one is, is, is a real case in point. I think Tampon Tuesday is as well. I mean, the thing that we're holding people back in Tampon Tuesday was just the consciousness of talking about it. And I think with Indigenous, uh, the situation that's happening now across the country, you are helping us to develop a language and a vocabulary that's one of consciousness and not just action. Action needs to be taken, but the awareness of why it needs to be taken is actually really important. It's not just simple like boiled water advisories or uh, Indigenous mm -hmm. folks living in poverty. You help us to understand how we got there and where we're coming from. And, you know, we've only got a couple of minutes left here, but I just think that agency for consciousness is the thing that creates the future. Whereas everything else might just be an action that people do over a project and then it can end. But as our minds grow and understand, we stay involved much longer and the relationships become enduring. I think that's what you are doing for this community right now. And I think it's fundamental to how we find a progress as London. Do you, do you see yourself in that mode or no? When I was nominated for an award and I, was, I got really complicated in my brain because I was getting nominated because I was putting, you know, people with poverty in front of me and, and Tampon Tuesday and at Los of Peace Awards. And I was getting really complicated about receiving an award on behalf of this type of work. And we were sitting on your porch and you started talking about when we invest in potential. And that really got me versus just handing out a tampon, just get you through the moment, right? This might get you through the day at school or maybe you can get to work today. But when we invest in potential, and I, I think that's what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that when we do have that agency, right? And that we do, you know, just no different than if, if my friend has breast cancer and I start a supper club for her, why wouldn't we, if our friend, we see they're having a housing crisis, why wouldn't we figure out how to help that guy get a house? Yeah. That we don't always have to show up during great sadness for one another. We can also show up when we see great potential and strength in one another, one another without expecting anything back. Yeah, I think I think that's yeah. I think that's where spirit spirituality maybe lies for me. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Mandy, you're helping us all to become enter into this world of greater consciousness. I think it's not just causes. It's not just actions or projects. Mm -hmm. And I really want to thank you for what you've done for us as a community that way. You know, I, I think we need more and more looking at these alternative ways of defining our problems and ways in which we deal with them. And you have really helped us with that. So thank you, Mandy. Thank you for doing this. Uh, but uh, there's so many of us that are right behind people like you and Lynn all the way with what you're trying mm -hmm. to do with the Indigenous stuff. Thank you that you've given us a path in all of this. So many Londoners involved with what you're doing now, organizations and businesses. I hope you know how much you're appreciated because we sure appreciate you tons. Thanks, Mandy. Well, thank Thanks, Glenn. I really appreciate all the support and help through the years. Yeah. Truly. All right.